my students sitting in a row are former students. Uh, this, is a, this is the inaugural lecture series. Um, I originally wanted to call it the last lecture, but for many of the faculty, choosing to teach more than this one time was probably appropriate. So we decided to call it after a, a short book that I wrote called Pearls Along the Path. And I'll just tell you a little bit about where this came from. There's a book out now called The Last Lecture. I don't know if any of you have read it, but I, but I did. And, and I felt two things about it. One, what a heartwarming story. Two, there's not much substance. The guy basically says, don't be a workaholic and love your family more. Now that's an important lesson. I'm not saying that it's not. But I just didn't see the deep wisdom in just that statement. Um, so I thought back to all of my colleagues at Villanova, and I taught at seven different universities. If you have learned anything, but I taught at seven universities. And over that time, far and away, the best teachers are at Villanova. And I thought to some of the people, how much wisdom they have to give, how much I've gained by being in their presence, by having conversations with them in the hall, or stopping by their offices, or going out to lunch with them. And so I thought we should have a series where they don't just talk about what they do as academics. But they really talk to you about their own accumulated wisdom over time, from all the years they've, so they've been here, all the years they've reflected on their professions, and all the years they've tried to guide students, faculty, and staff along the way. So I thought Bob Nidick would be a, a good first one, and I've asked Dan O'Mara to be our second one. Um, and for those of you who don't know Dan, Dan was the uh, ran our county department for many, many years. I worked alongside him as a department chair, um, and he's going to be spending his last year here teaching at Villanova next year. And I think what a what a what an opportunity for us to capture, you know. Dan on film and on tape so that we can have that in perpetuity. And I want to be able to do that for a lot of our faculty here. The goal is long term to have enough of these that have accumulated that we can go to our alumni and say, would you like to have them to take a walk down memory lane with one of your favorite professors? And then whatever revenue we can generate off that, I'd like it to go into providing opportunities for service for undergraduate students because we have a number of trips that happen here. It would be nice to have some money. So um, 10 years from now, 12 years from now, when you reflect back on your experiences here and you say, I would really like to remember that particular person, hopefully we'll capture them on DVD or whatever exists at that time. Okay? Vulcan Mind Pro, I have no idea. Let me take this as an opportunity to welcome Bob Nidick. And then, of course, when he's done speaking and answering questions, we're going to have a reception outside. Uh, that was provided by Melinda German, who has uh, runs our undergraduate program. But I've known Bob now for uh, over 20 years. Uh, Bob and I met when I became a faculty member here in the fall of 1989. And somebody said that we had a series, a lecture series here, that brought in professors. And I said, well, I want to do that too. And they said, well, you should go to Bob Nidick and maybe you and Bob can do it together. So I walked into Bob's office just one day and, and we, we hit it off famously. I, I, I've, I've often said that uh, that chance opportunity for Bob and I to get together really changed a lot of the ways I think and view the world and it made my life better here during the time I was a faculty member uh, at Villanova. But I walked in and we developed this series and we did some things that were relatively unique in it. But over the time, I had an opportunity to talk to Bob on many occasions. I probably have had more lunches with Bob than any other faculty member on our campus. And oftentimes, I'll come away with a little a new wrinkle on things. So I thought it'd be great to start out. Now, Bob has uh, been, I think, a lifelong resident of, of our area. His undergraduate degree at what's now Philadelphia University, his MBA at the Wharton School, and his PhD at Temple. Um, when he graduated with his PhD, he went to serve his alma mater, uh, which was, at the time, was it still called Textiles at the time? Textiles at the time. And then we decided that we needed him to kind of move up the food chain, so he was invited over to Villanova University. He is one of the very finest teachers I've ever known. He is probably one of the most caring and considerate professors you'll have ever an opportunity to take a class from. 
Um, I would say that I'm giving the ultimate compliment that I can give somebody. When I left here in 1996 to become a dean out in Oregon, my faculty was really confused about what model I was trying to build of what a good faculty member ought to be. So, I don't know, I was probably a few months in, or I guess I was a year in by that time, and I called, because that takes a year before you can really confuse a faculty when you're a dean, and so I called Bob up and I said, you know, Bob, would you come to the University of Portland and show them what I mean by a faculty member who can be great in the classroom, who can continue to do research and provide important leadership in life. So he actually came out there, and, uh, and I think it was an inspiration for several people here. At any rate, I want to introduce to you the inaugural speaker in our Pearls Along the Path series, uh, Dr. Robert Neidick, known as Dr. Bob to most of his students. Thank you, Ron. A little pressure on that. I thought Dan was going first. <laughs> Um, when I started to put some ideas uh, together for this talk, uh, I guess Ron asked me maybe six months ago, I don't know how long ago, but uh, I started to put some ideas together and I started to think about what I would talk about and I called Ron about, I don't know, six weeks ago and I said, you know, this is sounding a lot like a, like a commencement speech and I said, I don't know if that's what you're thinking about and he said, that's exactly what I was thinking. So, so anyway, uh, for those of you that know my wife, uh, I, I, was, I was finishing up the slides last night, and I said to her, would you, would you mind taking a look at these slides? Because I told her that, that you know, this is you know, sounding like a commencement speech. I said, would you mind taking a look at the slides and see what you think? So she looked at them, and she says, you know, that is the best commencement speech I've ever heard. And I thought, wow. Because again, for those of you who know my wife, that's not typical. <laughs> something she would say to me. And I said, you really think it's that good? She goes, not only is that good, but all the others have been really bad. So, <laughs> so I don't know. So we'll see. We'll see. Um, oh, I also want to apologize. Uh, I want to apologize for technical difficulties. I want to apologize ahead of time. Oh, there we go. I'm going to get Dr. Borden up here to fix this. <coughs> I have no idea what's up. Maybe it's just running slow. Um, I want to apologize ahead of time to the to the students, to my students that maybe heard a few of these stories before. Um, there, there hopefully will be a few new ones. Uh, I want to apologize to, to Matt, who has heard all of these stories before. And I guess I especially want to apologize to our youngest son, who's sitting, I don't know why he's here, but he's heard all these stories multiple times. So you, you know, if you heard a few of these, it could be worse. All right, um, and a lot of this, you know, will be, uh, oh yeah, uh, so a lot of this just will be sort of things that I've sort of collected. Ron actually, and you may or may not remember this, but um, I, I think it was when Ron first came back to Villanova after being away, he said, I want to write a book, right? That's, that's sort of the way this started. So I, 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 I listened to that, and I, and I started a file, and I started taking notes. So a lot of those notes ended up in here. Uh, and, and a lot of these are just sort of stories, collections of stories that I've, that, 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 have, that have been things that kind of hit me. Uh, so, uh, and this was, I, I want to start here. No one mentioned during this talk would think that they said or did anything worthy of being mentioned. Uh, and I think that's maybe what makes some of these things a, a little special. These are just, it, you know, I, I remember, well, one of them, I, I, I saw him about six months ago, and I said, you know what, when you told me that, I said, it was one of the most profound things I've ever heard. He didn't even remember saying, talking to me, or saying it, or anything. So I, I think that's, you know, something that's, that's important also. Um, so, you know, first, and, and parts of this, you'll see the, the, the theme of, uh, you know, from the book, uh, which was, I thought, a you know, well-written book, very sad story. But enjoy your work. This happened... Uh, uh, this was something that happened about, uh, well, during this past basketball season. Uh, there, there, will, they, there may be a theme of food running throughout the talk. I do. Ron said he had, he's had lunch with me more than <laughs> Yeah, I, for those of you that, that have been, I, I go to Yang Ming a lot. So uh, we, I think we've been to Yang Ming. I've been to Yang Ming a lot with Ron. So there are a lot of food stories that sort of 
run through. So anyway, I, I, we were eating at the Flemings for the first time. I'd never been there, right? You know, not too far from campus. It's a steakhouse. And uh, we went, you know, a bunch of us that were going to, to the Villanova game uh, met there for dinner. The same group about two months later went back again, and we happened to have the same server. And my son was, our other son, was trying to figure out what we were, what we had ordered for appetizers the previous trip. And uh, the, he was having trouble remembering everything that we had ordered the last time. He remembered that we liked a bunch of things, but he couldn't remember exactly what we ordered. And the server said, you had this, 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 and this. And he rattled off exactly what we had eaten. And I, we all kind of looked at him. And he said, and you sat right over there. It was the same group. And, and I was just astounded that, that, you know, it was one visit to a restaurant six weeks or so before. And yet he re not only remembered us, but he also remembered everything that we ate. I still don't know how he did that, by the way. Uh, but I was impressed. I mean, that, and, I, and, I, and I, we've eaten there a few more times. I always ask for him now. His name's, by the way, Nicola. Although he told me on his last trip he's leaving. He's going back to uh, Las Vegas, where, which is where he worked before. But he's just someone that enjoys his work. He's passionate about his work. He, he takes pride in his work. And it was just, you know, again, I mean, he, he, it, it, was, it was nothing, you know, for him to, to you know, it was, it was nothing memorable that, that he did. But it, it impressed me as someone that really took pride uh, in their work. Uh, yeah, here's another. Do the right thing. Uh, this is not a food one, but uh, I, I, about 10 years ago, I bought a pair of shoes. And, and uh, I, I, I started wearing the shoes, and they didn't feel right. So I, I, they felt really tight. And when I remember when I tried them on, they said, oh, no, go loosen up, which I guess is a thing when you're a shoe salesperson. That's, one of the things, oh yeah, that'll loosen up, that's not, that'll loosen up. So I, okay, it feels tight, but you know, you're the shoe person, so I guess this is okay. And, and I wore them for about a month or so, uh, and, and they, they never loosened up. And, and it, it was, got to the point where it was actually hurting. So I called the store back, I said, these, these things just <coughs> don't fit right, they're, they're too small. Oh no, well, sorry, but you know, you, you bought them and that's just the way it is. So I, I went on the website, because I tend to be I was going to say a bit obsessive. I'm not a bit obsessive. I'm extremely obsessive. So I went on the website. I found another person that sold the shoes. It happened to be Sherman Brothers Shoes right down here next to Glifty's. And I just walked in the store. And I said, you know, I bought these shoes. I know that I didn't buy them from you, but you carry them. And I'm confused. Could you, you know, could you take a look at them? And he, and he, and he looked at them and he sized my foot. And he said, they're two sizes too small. Not one, not a half size. Two, two full sizes too small. So I said, all right, well, I need new shoes. So he says, well, I'll tell you what. He said, this wasn't your fault. He, he, he says, where did, you know, what happened? I told him exactly what happened. And he, said, he said, where did you get them? I told him the store, which I don't even remember now. Uh, he has told the story several times. Um, and he took those shoes back. And he gave me new shoes, the right size, same shoe, but the right size shoe. We are very, very, very good friends uh, today because of the start of that. I mean, you know, he's, matter of fact, he was just, he and his wife and his daughter, they were at, my, at our house this past Saturday. You know, we, we've, you know, we've traveled with them. You, you don't know what impact something can have. And, and that was, he didn't have to do that. He had, he, he, that cost him money. Now, he ended up making money, you know, because of that, right? Because I guess I've become a fairly decent customer of his. But, but I won't go anywhere else. Right? Matter of fact, my father, I was, I, uh, I, I was driving, I needed, a, well, I needed a pair of shoes, we were away, and, and I called him, I called Ken up, this was the owner, Ken Sherman, I called him up and I said, what size shoe do I take, because I don't even know what size shoe I take, my, my father, it was, he, he happened to be in the back seat, and he was like, it was, my son, the PhD, doesn't even know what size shoe he wears, but, but that's the relationship I have with Ken, and, 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 and with other people like that. You know, I, I, when I go to Fleming's, I like Nicola to take care of me, at least while he's, while he's there. Ken's down there, I know he'll, I know he'll do a good job. Um, listen to the people that you work with or that you serve. I just, I found this, this was something I stumbled across not too long ago. It was actually a, 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 a medical doctor who told me this. What is the average amount of time a doctor listens to a patient before interrupting? I was, I was astounded. The average amount of time that a doctor listens to a patient before interrupting. Uh, any ideas? 
Five seconds. <laughs> yeah. I guess the doctor's feeling are that, you know, that their time is very valuable. They actually, their study's been done 18 seconds. That's all you get when you're interrupted. Listen, listen to people. Um, you know, people have things to say. Uh, what they have to say is, is, is you know, possibly of, of value. So, um, here's something: is, is you know, for the seniors in, in the group. I think you know, all of you, the ones that I know, are all seniors. Um, some sophomores. Sophomores. Okay, they're, they're your students. Okay. Um, Don't Here's an email exchange I had with uh, our new insurance agent <coughs> recently. Uh, he sent me an email, at, uh, I put the time down here, he sent me an email at 4.35, it would be a good idea to get all of the jewelry appraised. That was one of the, one of the points in an email that came to me at 4.35. I guess I was busy or whatever, didn't have time, didn't respond, didn't have time, didn't see it till later that night. So I responded at 9.04. I said, sorry to be a pain, but do you really want me to get jewelry that is worth about $100 appraised? Right, that was at 9.04 p.m. Uh, at 9.12, uh, he said, no, just a few higher-priced pieces. I wrote back at 9.14. I said, great, thank you. What are you doing answering emails from a pain-in-the-butt client at 9.12 p.m.? Okay. The, the response I got was the best email I've ever received. And again, for the people that are, uh, Jim's back there from QVC, wouldn't you like people like this working for you? Because my wife happened to be here reading this, and she said, I want to offer him a job, All right, was, was her response. Uh, he said, I don't want someone else answering my client's questions at 9, 12 at night. All right? I, obviously, that's above and beyond. I don't, you don't expect that, but it was nice, and it was noticed. All right? it was, and, and I think he appreciated the fact that I noticed that. So, you know, again, care about, you know, care about the work you're doing. Um, and take pride in the work you're doing. Uh, this is a story, a lot, be careful what you ask for. This is a story that uh, a lot of my stories revolve around food. Some of my stories, as Matt knows all too well, revolve around softball. Um, and, and this was a story from about 15 years ago, uh, but it was something that always stuck with me. Uh, I was playing uh, softball back then. I don't play anymore, but I was playing back then. And I, I sort of essentially organized the team. And, and we had a, a, a guy playing third base for us that was, the softball players tend to be a little you know, rougher around the edges uh, than a lot of the other people that I'm used to hanging out with. Uh, let's just put it that way. So, so uh, he was our third baseman, and, and, and uh, you know, he, was, he was pretty good. Uh, and we had a, a, new, a new coach came in and, and was doing the, you know, the, the coaching uh, running the, 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 uh, yeah, the games, you know, once the game started. I would kind of get things organized before the game, and then, and then Bruce would take over once the game started. Well, the third baseman was not happy uh, about the playing time that he has, had been receiving once Bruce took over. The, the third baseman's playing time had decreased. So he was basically you know, complaining to me. And, you know, so I, I listened to him, and, and, and so eventually we you know, got to a point where we had a meeting, the three of us. I was there really just to observe, and um, Vinny, was, Vinny was the third baseman, and Bruce was the coach. And Vinny proceeds, I can say this, there's my good buddy here to my right, I'm half Italian, Matt's half Italian, this guy was 100% Italian, so his, his, his Italian passion took over from the third baseman, and he basically unloaded for about 10 minutes on Bruce. And just told him that you know before he got there he was playing all the time and Bruce was you know Bruce didn't know how to coach he didn't know how to evaluate talent you know it just just unloaded on him and Vinny is Italian as I said and, and, and a little passionate and you know the hands were going and so forth and Bruce's reaction is he's not Italian but I, I thought he was actually just going to punch him and then, but, you know and then that would have. You know, then I didn't know what was going to happen. We were right in the middle of the tournament, you know, in between games and the tournament. Bruce listened to him for about 10 minutes, and uh, then he got to the end, and he just stopped. Bruce just looked at him, and there was this awkward pause, and then he didn't know what to say next. Bruce just kept staring at him, and uh, finally, 
then he said, well, do you have any reaction? And Bruce said, are you done? And then he says, well, yeah. And he goes, well, you're done. And he says, yeah. He says, now, is there anything else you want to say? And I'm thinking, all right, he's going to hit him. And, you know, I'm going to have to break up the fight. And, and then he says, no. He says, you're sure. There's nothing else you want to say about this. And he goes, no. He goes, all right. And he looked at him and he goes, you're not good enough to cause this much trouble. And he turned around and he walked away. I'm like, wow. Man. I never had the guts to say that when I was department chair. Right? There were days that I wanted to say that at times. Maybe some other department chairs felt the same way. Um, but that was a pretty pretty important lesson. Maybe it wasn't a business thing, but, but it was like, okay. He was saying exactly what was on his mind. So be careful what you say and what you what you wish for. You guys want to sit or, or well, I mean you are sitting. You want to sit in a seat? You can't stay. Sharon, are you staying? You're making me nervous over there. <laughs> All right. Um, it's your backup band, don't worry. It's a backup band. <laughs> Try to make a difference uh, in someone's life. Um, and, and a bunch of people on this side of the room have been on several trips. Uh, a few people have been, on, have been on the trips. But when, when Hurricane Katrina hit on August uh, 29th, 2005, I went home to my wife shortly, a few days after that, and I said, I either, you know, I, well, I've been teaching, this is, I think it's my 30th year of teaching, which is a little scary thought. But anyway, I went home to my wife and I said, you know what, I've either had the best idea of my career or the worst idea of my career. It's not going to be in the middle. Um, and she said, what are you doing now? And I said, I want to take my students down to New Orleans. And uh, the long and the short of it is um, that, that, that uh, first semester right after Katrina hit, uh, about seven weeks or so after Katrina hit, 12 of us went down to New Orleans. Um, and we didn't know what we were, I walked in, well, my, my first phone call was with Kathy Burns. Um, and I knew Kathy was raising money for the, uh, for the victims through the university, which a lot of organizations were doing. And I said, Kathy, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're, uh, I know the university's raising money. She said, yes. I said, uh, how much have you raised, if I could ask? And at the time, she said, well, about $25,000. I said, do you know what you're going to do with the money? She said, I have no idea what we're going to do with the money. And I said, well, I'd like to volunteer my students. Um, and if it's a shame Kathy's not here, but she could validate all this. But uh, um, I said, I'd like to volunteer my students. She said, well, what would you do? And I said, well, we would go down to New Orleans see firsthand what damages have been done, you know, are there, see who needs money, come back, use some, some techniques that I teach in the class, and we'll make a recommendation to you where the money should go uh, and how it should best be, be allocated. And her, her, her initial response was maybe typical, but she's, you know, maybe expected. She said, we're in the business school. You know, what, what do you know about that stuff? And I said, okay, well, you know, let's see. I said, here, we'll make it nice and simple. We'll, 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 you know, we'll study this. We'll make a recommendation. If you like it, you can listen. If not, throw it away. You're no worse off. I said, but we're going to go down. We're going to pay our own way. And, and uh, we're going to see you know, firsthand what's, what's down there. We took that first trip. Uh, and as I said, about seven weeks after Katrina hit, we were there. I walked into class the next day, by the way. And I told the class this is what I, I want to do and that I talked with Kathy. And, she says we could do it, and I said if anybody wants to go, you know, we'll, we'll try to make this try to make this work. And, and I and I had about half the class, you know, were able to go. And I said, well, here's the problem. I said, uh, you know, we have to leave if, if this is going to work. We have to leave in about five weeks or so, and uh, I don't know where we're staying. I don't know how we're going to get there because the airports were closed. Um, and, you know, but this is what I want to work towards. And, and as I said, we did go down shortly after that, and. Um, you know, we made a, we made a recommendation, and the, Kathy made a few minor tweaks uh, for some things that, that she wanted to be wanted to do that that, uh, that we, we didn't incorporate into our into our analysis. But for the most part, most of what we suggested was, was actually implemented that first time. That laid the groundwork for subsequent trips. We've had seven more trips since then, um, and what we do now is I, I remember walking around the, a habitat site in in uh, Slidell, Louisiana and uh, talking with the president. The president of the Habitat site uh, took about an hour out of his day, as I said, seven weeks after, after the storm, to meet with us and talk with us about the things that they were doing after the storm, 
and, 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 and I'm thinking, you know, here you are, you know, you, there's so much work to be done, and here we are coming down. You know, yeah, we, we, we recommended and we donated some money to, to them, but, but, you know, he was taking time out of his busy schedule to meet with us. And I remember saying to him, I'll be back. So, but next time, we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to bring in a group of students and we're going to, uh, we're actually going to do some work and help you. And, we, and we've done that now on the seven subsequent trips and a bunch of the people. I mean, Gary, how many trips have you been on? This past week before. Four. Four. Frank? Two. two. Shannon, two. And Meg? Two. Yeah, okay. So, the, the, the repeat. We've had, again, we now have the Cody Tucci Award, uh, who's been on, actually, I think he, I think he, was, he went once when I wasn't even on a trip, but uh, I think Cody's been down there six times. Cody's, Cody's not only graduated as an undergrad, he's graduated from our Masters of Finance program, and he's now out working, and he still goes. So um, he's kind of, the students have nicknamed him the creepy old guy. <laughs> anyway, um, the students then are, my, you know, we donated all the money at the first time, so now the students in, in, in my class raise money uh, and then donate it back. And, and uh, you know, I'm proud, and I, I talk about this because I really do nothing. And in fact, if anybody's been on the trip, they know that I do very little work. And that's primarily because the homeowners don't want me doing any work when they see <laughs> some of the work that I've tried to do. Please, take any tools away from that guy. So, uh, uh, that's true. That's true. I organize, I facilitate, that, that's my role. Uh, and we eat well, right? We always come back weighing a few extra pounds. Uh, but anyway, um, the students do all the work. You know, they they raise the money. They you know they they, they decide where the money's going to go. They they talk with the people. Um, and, and and students in my classes have raised and donated almost forty five thousand dollars in the seven trips that we've done. And that that's a testament to the to your generation, really, right? To, to things that you can do. Uh, you don't always hear about that kind of stuff on the news, but uh, I've had, I've had friends of mine ask, you know, why would you do that? Why, you know, in today's litigious society and you know everything, why would you take on that responsibility? And, and, and I've learned if you ask the question, you probably wouldn't understand the answer. And so I, I, I try anymore now not to even, well, it's, it, it's a fun thing to do with the kids and they, they do a nice job with it. But, you know, if you ask the question, as I said, you probably wouldn't understand the answer. Um, Yeah, this is another one. What kind of employee uh, will you be? Um, in fact, it's uh, kind of fitting that Tim Monaghan walked in at that moment because this, this <coughs> is true. Because this, I probably, Tim, Tim wanted to hire someone. I won't, I won't give the name of the person he wanted to hire. But Tim wanted to hire someone, and he called me, and he knew that I, I, I knew this person uh, be, you know, from where they worked before. And he said to me, do me a favor and, and check out. And he said, I have, just have some questions and you know, whether this, is really, this person is going to really be the right fit for what we're looking for. And I, I made some calls and I came back and I remember saying to Tim, um, well, here, here's what they said. Uh, when I, the, one, the one person that I called said, there's some people that you have to work with and there's some people that you want to work with. Uh, so my question to you is, you know, what kind of person are you? Are you going to be someone that people have to work with, or are you, are you going to be someone that people want to work with? Uh, Tim hired that person, and uh, she's become, I think, one of our most valued employees, uh, certainly in the building. Um, so I wrote down here, I, don't, I, don't, I wasn't sure whether I should keep this or not, but there are a lot of people that I have to work with, but fewer that I want to work with. But I think, I think anybody can say that, so I um, wasn't sure whether I should keep that in or not. Um, this one, I mean, this is, this is, when I, when I kind of gathered some thoughts and ideas, they, they just kind of fit in different places. This applies to, you know, being an employee or whatever. It, it, that happens to be, um, happens to be, uh, you know, kind of lessons learned about being a parent. Some of you may be parents someday. Uh, kids, somebody, a good friend of mine uh, told me this a few months ago. Uh, kids remember more what you do with them than what you do for them. I like that. I, just, I kind of like that, that idea, you know. I think, I think a lot of time parents, a lot of time parents want to be their, their kid's best friend, which is nice. There's nothing wrong with that, except, you know, sometimes they need to be parents also. And, and uh, instead of just giving kids whatever they want, um, this is the way uh, my friend Eric Johnson said, kids remember more what you do with them than what you do for them. Um, this, was, this was the best parenting lesson I, I've ever, uh, that I ever learned. Uh, and the, the results of this is sitting in the front row over there, so I'm not sure if this worked or not. But 
Um, this was a neighbor, and this was when our oldest son was about four years old. Uh, I, was, I was standing on our front lawn, and our, our neighbor, Jack, uh, was a uh, Philadelphia detective. And we were standing on our front lawn, and our oldest son, who, as I said, Rob, was about four years old at the time. He did something wrong. I don't know if he did nothing serious, but just something wrong. And, I, and Jack was standing there, and I said, Rob, if you do that again, Jack was going to arrest you. I said to my son. That was my, my parenting. You know, that was the extent of my parenting ability. If you do that again, Rob, so Jack's going to arrest you. And I learned the most important, the most important lesson of being a parent that I, you know, that I, in my life from Jack at that moment. Because he completely ignored me, which was probably the appropriate thing to do. And he got down on one knee at, at Rob's level. And he just looked right in his eye and he said, Rob, no, police officers don't arrest little kids. He said, that's their parents' job, to, to discipline me. He said, police officers won't do that. And i like, wow, it hit me like a ton of bricks, of course. You know, it's like, that's our responsibility. Um, so I, I try not to shirk that responsibility. I, I wasn't going to tell any stories about Greg. Well, I, I, I really wasn't. And then he told me, I didn't think he was coming. So he said, I, I, I'm coming, so whatever. Uh, this involves Greg when he was about nine years old. And, and he was, uh, let's put it this way, Greg, Greg was one of the most difficult children I can ever imagine trying to raise. Um, if you still ask him now, he's never been wrong in his life. Some of you have the privilege of teaching Greg and you can attest to that also. Uh, he's never made a mistake in his life. He's never been wrong in his life. So, about nine years old, we're in, I, I, because of Ron, all this sort of fits together. I don't know how it fits together, but, uh, and actually it was because of Max. It all, I have ADD, by the way, in case I <laughs> couldn't figure that out. Um, I've not been diagnosed, but I'm sure I have it. Anyway, Matt, in 1994, went to Paris. When did you go to Paris? So I went over to my wife. I said, Matt, Mary, and the kids, they're going to, they're going to Paris. Uh, for six months, and, and she said, "Wow!" And I said, "You know, hey, would you like to do something?" And she goes, "Well, I'm not, I don't know if I'd really like to go to Paris." She said, "We do something good. I, there's only one place I'd like to go." And I said, "Geez, I was thinking about it too. There's only one place I'd want to go." And I said, "Where do you want to go?" She said, "Australia." And I said, "That's where I want to go." And so it was amazing. First time in our married life that we ever agreed on anything big like that. And 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 Ron was going to Australia shortly after that. And I said, "If you can find someone to do a teaching exchange, you know, we'll we'll go." And I still remember Matt and I were working on, on our book. And, and, the, and, the comp and he walked back after being up for like 47 straight hours, flew straight back, because you're, you're you know, from Australia, your, your internal clock is all off. He came right in, he found us in, in the room, and he says, you're going to Perth. And I'm like, I, I wasn't really serious about that. I'm like, I'm not serious about that. You're going to Perth. Okay, we're going to Perth. And we went to Perth. So, getting back, it always somehow gets back. So now, we're, Greg's nine years old. We're walking around the streets. Uh, because we took about a month to get to Perth, which is our family vacation. And I actually, he just, I thought I pulled him aside, grabbed him, not pulled him, but I got him aside and I said, you know, you just don't seem happy. And he goes, I'm not happy. I don't know if I should be saying this stuff. But I'm not happy. I said, all right. I said, you know, you don't like to compare kids. You know, that's, that's, I, like, I, I know that. That's not a good thing to do. Like, oh, your brother's wonderful. <laughs> Which, by the way, I don't, I don't believe either, but anyway. So, but I, I said, you know, like, look at Rob. He just, he just seems happier, you know? And I, and I said, here, I said, Rob, I said, I want to try to teach you a very simple lesson of living in our family. I said, because Rob learned this lesson. And, and, and I said to him, I said, you know, it's very simple being, being a kid in our family. I said, you do everything. He's nine years old, right? You can remember this. He's nine years old. I said, you do everything we ask you to do. I said, if your mother asks you to take the trash out, you take the trash out. If your mother wants you to, you know, walk the dog, you walk, whatever, whatever, you know, whatever we ask you to do. We don't need to do that much, but whatever we ask you to do, that's what we want you to do. You do it, so you do it. When we ask you, you do it right, do it without any hassles, no stress. I said, and then, when you ask us for things, most of the time, we're going to say yes. And that, and that, I said, not all the time, because we're the parents, and sometimes we're going to say no. But I said, all you have to do, you do everything we want you to do, and most of the time, we'll say yes for the things you want to do. <coughs> Nine years old, he tells you a lot about Greg. He looks at me, and he goes, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to negotiate. I said, what? He goes, you let me do everything I want to do, and I'll do most of what you want me to do. <laughs> and I just said, there's your problem. <laughs> We're the parent. You're the kid. I don't know. If that, actually, he's gotten, he's gotten better. Not much, but he's gotten better. 
Um, so again, don't be afraid to say no. You know, I mean, I, I think you know, I think we have good. I, I think I have a good relationship with my kids, but you know, I do say no. Things to do every day. Don't be afraid to laugh at yourself. Uh, that's probably my number one lesson. Uh, if anybody's ever driven on one of those trips with me, um, hey, I don't. I take my. I take my responsibilities as a teacher seriously, for example, but I don't take myself too seriously, at least I hope not. Um, and if I, if, if, if I ever can't do that, then I'll know when it's time to get out of this profession. Don't be afraid to say I'm sorry. You know, I, hey, I've screwed up plenty of times, um, especially in a Catholic university. Say I'm sorry. Don't be afraid to say I made a mistake. Um, and this is, I don't know, I, I know some people didn't like this movie. I thought it was a pretty good movie. Uh, don't be afraid to... Yeah don't, be, yeah, don't be afraid to have a bucket list. Find the joy in your life. Um, you know, that, that's, that's one of the things that I've tried to do. You know, I try to have fun. Try to, you know, try to find that joy. Uh, here are just some sayings. Uh, and I actually, because of this, I actually went out and Googled some, you know, Googled some of these. Like, well, who said that? I mean, you know, people would say this to me. Like, oh, this was a friend of mine said this to me. I'm like, wow, that's profound. It turns out like, he read it somewhere. So, I mean, he's still a nice guy. He's not as smart. It's, it's just a, not, not anyone here. It's not Matt. Matt's profound, but in a different way. Um, but, you know, it's nice to be important, but it's important to be nice. I like that. It was actually Sir John Templeton. Uh, we had an MBA student here, um, Graham, what's his name? Sinclair, Graham Sinclair. Yeah. He works for the Templeton Foundation. I, I, I emailed him. I said, what, what can you tell me about this? And he, he emailed back. He said, I, I never knew anything about it. I didn't know anything about this. So I didn't learn any, get any insight into like, how that comment came, but, you know, came aboard. But anyway, Sir John Templeton. It's nice to be important, but it's important to be nice. Um, this is one, that matter, this is one that, uh, that Ken Sherman, although he gave me the wrong reference, because I, well, at least what I, when I Googled, this is what I found. Johann Wolfgang van Goethe. Is that how to pronounce that, Matt? Good. Yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> that was a long time ago. The other thing is, when you... Go Goethe? Yeah. Good. All right. Uh, the other thing is, when, you know, some of this stuff, it's, you know, it was written in a time when the women's movement hadn't really... Uh, they didn't know anything about the women's movement, so I apologize for anything that sounds sexist. Uh, but I think you get the idea. You can easily judge the character of a, of a man by how he treats those who can do nothing for him. I mean, take the gender specific stuff out of there, but I, I still think you, know, you can learn a lot uh, about someone uh, you know, when, when, you, when you think about that. This was, this was an article that I found. It was actually in Today Magazine. Oh, I'm sorry, Today. USA Today uh, in uh, 2006. And uh, Office Depot CEO Steve Odlin remembers like it was yesterday, working in an upscale French restaurant in Denver. The purple sorbet and cut glass he was serving tumbled under the expensive white gown of an obviously rich and important woman. I watched in slow motion, ruining her dress for the evening. I thought I would be shot on sight. Thirty years have passed, but Odlin can't get the stain out of his mind, nor the woman's kind reaction. She was startled, regained composure, and in a reassuring voice told the teenage Odlin, it's okay, it wasn't your fault. When she left the restaurant, she also left the future Fortune 500 CEO with a life lesson. You can tell a lot about a person by the way he or she treats the waiter. Uh, Ordlin isn't the only CEO to have made this discovery. Rather, it seems to be one of those rare laws of the land that every CEO learns on the way up. It's hard to get a dozen CEOs to agree on anything, but all interviewed agreed with the waiter rule. Beware of anyone who pulls out the power card to say something like, I could buy this place and fire you, or I know the owner could have you fired. Those who say such things have revealed more about their character than about their wealth and power. Whoever, comes, whoever came up with the waiter observation is bang spot on, said BMW North American President Tom Purvis. Uh, well, I forget that. The CEO who came up with it, or at least first wrote it down, is Raytheon CEO Bill Swanson. He wrote a booklet of 33 short observations called Swanson's Unwritten Rules of Management. Raytheon has given away 250,000 of the books. Among those 33 rules, is only one that Swanson says never fails. A person who is nice to you, but rude to the waiter or to other people, is not a nice person. Um, so anyway, you know, try to try to be nice. These people are just. My wife, my wife often says, "Do you think it's your your job to uh, you know to entertain servers?" You know, well, 
I think their, I think their jobs uh, can be kind of boring. I mean, they bring you food and stuff. So I, I try to, I try to entertain them if I can. Um, Kathy can tell you this, and, and this is I was, I was part of Jeff right here. Is we interviewed a lot of people. We hired a few, but we interviewed a lot of people. Kathy will tell you whenever at the end of the day, I'd always sit down with Kathy. All right, what do you think? How they treat you? How was your interaction with them? That was very important to me. How they treated, you know, how they treated, you know, how they treated Kathy. Kathy, Kathy was was a wonderful, you know, I don't know, she's not even secretary, you know, she ran the department. But and, and and problem students and problem parents, she would take care of. Every once in a while, she'd say, you know, you got to take care of this. I, I, it always struck me, you know, she would. We, we would occasionally get some an irate parent, you know, not not that often, fortunately, but you know, occasionally we would. And it just always irritated me. You know, when they were being obnoxious to the support staff, and then I get on the phone, and they're, they're as nice as can be to me. Wait a minute. I know how you were just treating you know, you know, the administrative assistant here. Now you're, you know, I, I, that, that, that rubs me the wrong way. So, you know, again, just try to, you know, maybe remember that. Oh, there was a, another friend of mine. He's a, uh, he's a partner at, at one of the largest law firms in the city. I was golfing with him last summer. Uh, he and, and his friend, who's also a partner at the same law firm, and they were telling a story about a guy that they had that interviewed, and they were making an offer to be partner at this at this law firm. Um, and they and they, they were going golfing, and they said, you know, the, the two partners that I had been playing golf with the day that they were going to make, you know, six months before when they were going to make this offer of a partnership to the to this guy, and he didn't know he was going to offer going to get offered a partnership. The, uh, the two of them said, should we tell them before the round or after the round? And he said, you know what, let's not, you know, let's just play golf, let's just have some fun. We'll tell them after the round. Well, the guy didn't behave real well on the golf course, uh, and that, that person today does not realize that he lost the partnership offer because of that round of golf, just because of the way he behaved. They never made him the offer. I mean, it was, he was throwing clubs and profanity, and so you know, again, keep keep that in perspective. Um, this is the one that I was telling you about earlier. That I, I, I asked this guy. I said, "Where did you hear that?" Because I googled this one. I couldn't find this anywhere. Uh, it was a Buddy of mine that I sometimes golf with. There's a golf theme too, I guess. But uh, there are uh, there are two types of people in the world: insecure people and people who know that they are insecure. That thing hit me like, wow! Explains a lot of behavior. Explains a lot of behavior. We're all insecure. We're all insecure. I think we have maybe we're more secure in certain parts of our life than other parts of our life, but we're all we're all insecure. Um, and I think if you can recognize that and, and deal with that. Uh, you know, maybe maybe you're be a little bit better off. I know I have plenty of insecurities. This is something I have on my website. I just threw this on actually at the last minute. To know why to uh, to know why to do something is wisdom. To know how to do it is skill. To know when to do it is judgment. To strive to do it best is dedication. To do it for the benefit of others is service. To want to help others is compassion. To do it quietly is humility. I like that one. Uh, to get the job done is achievement. To inspire and motivate others is to do all these to, to do all these things as leadership. Um, so, you know, again, I, these are just words. I, I just I just think I think about some of these things. Um, how are we doing on time? We got about five minutes. We're doing all right on time. Sure. I think we're yeah. I think we're actually yeah. Right. We're, we are. This is the last slide. Yeah, this is the last slide. Um, care about the people. There was a student. Matter of fact, I think it was actually in this room. He's sitting right there. His name's A.J. Fusco. Matt, you remember A.J.? Of course. Living up in New York now. He was sitting right there. I seriously think it was this room. And I walked over, it was about halfway through a semester, and I walked over and I just leaned over and I said, I whispered to him quietly, I'd like to see you after class. Finished the class. Class ended, he came up, he came up, he's glad everybody else left. We were alone in the room. I just said, what's up? I said, what's wrong? What do you mean, what's wrong? I said, what's wrong? What do you mean, what's wrong? I said, I can tell you just report yourself. And he says, how could you tell? I said, I don't know. And he just tell me. And he just looked at me and he said, I broke up with my girlfriend last night. I said, no. Sorry to hear that. You know, we can talk about it. And he said, yeah, if you don't mind. I said, we'll go back to the house and talk about it. I don't know. There was something, he didn't, he didn't say anything. I mean, I, I don't know what it was. I just, you know, there was something I sensed. I, I, you know, I just sort of reached out. And then I, I mean, it could have been, could have just said nothing. It could have really been nothing wrong. But 
the end of that story is we became friends. I called him up. Matter of fact, when our oldest son was a sophomore here, and I, he went out. He never worked for anyone. AJ never worked for anyone. Um, he, he, he never could work for anyone. <laughs> Remember AJ? Yeah. And he went, went went right into business for himself. And he was doing some internet stuff. And our, and our older son was interested in the internet, so I called AJ and I said, AJ, I need you to do me a favor. And he says, what? I said, I need you to hire my son for the summer. I said, you don't have to pay him. I said, you tell him you're paying him, I don't care. He said, no, no, no. You know, so, but that's, you know, again, that was, you know, maybe partly the relationship that, that we, we've developed. Uh, he actually, uh, interestingly, at the end of the story, is he got back together with that girl. Uh, they ended up getting married. Uh, we were invited to the wedding. We, it was out in Vegas. We didn't go. We got pictures. He had a, uh, he had an Elvis wedding. He was, he was dressed up as... As Elvis, you know, it was kind of bizarre. Um, this is this was a story about um, my cousin, who was probably a couple years older than me, uh, and unfortunately he passed away. Um, and we went to his service, and and one of his friends stood up and, and gave a eulogy, and delivered a eulogy, and and. and I've actually used this a few times in letters of recommendation at this point. And, he, and, and what the gentleman said, speaking about my cousin, was his passion for life. And, and, and you know, and, and I remember saying, he says, you know, he says, and, and, he, and he loved his church. Um, and he said, and he said uh, you know, sometimes you know, when the sermon is a little slow, I remember he looked over and said, sorry, Pastor. <laughs> So, uh, but he said, you know, people would sometimes after church you know, say, hey, that, that, that sermon's a little slow. And he, he said his, his, his response always was, I came for a meal. I came for a meal. So I always, you know, uh, I always remembered that. You know, go through life. You, know, you came for a meal. Grab for everything you can. And, uh, and then, so, you know, I, I came to, he came to church for a meal. Kathy, right before I started, you got the quote slightly wrong, but it's it's here. Think about what you want on your tombstone. It may say a lot about how you lived your life. About five years ago, five years, maybe, no, probably longer, probably about eight or nine, ten years ago. Time goes so fast. Uh, I, 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 I knew my wife would never follow through on this, and Greg, well, you've already heard about Greg, so I, I went to our older son, and I said, I'm serious about this. I said, I'm, I'm really serious. And I said, I really want you to do this. I said, I've, I've figured out what I want on my tombstone. And I said, you know, I said, I know your mother thinks this is a joke, and she won't do it. Greg is Greg. But that's what I want on my tombstone. I had a blast. You know, I want somebody walking her through that cemetery saying, who the heck is that guy? Who would put that on their tombstone? But it's, it, it, it tries to say how I've lived my life. I, I, I try, try and have as much fun as I can. When I hear that long, I don't want to end this on the downer necessarily, but but turn it around and and, and you know, do what you can do. You know, I mean, you know, I I, I I write papers with Matt because I enjoy spending time with Matt. You know, Ron and I have written one paper. How many papers did you write? One. Or one, but it was yeah, the most cited. Yeah, yeah Ron, Ron likes to say it, it, it apparently had somewhat of an impact on, on one Practice. part of our field. Yeah. So, you know, I, I just enjoy, you know, I, I, t I try to work with people that I enjoy hanging out with. And, 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 it, and it's not work. You know, it's really not work. So, anyway, thank you for listening to me ramble on. There were just some thoughts, uh, some kind of random observations that I jotted down over the past six months or so. Um, Maybe you took away something. Hopefully there was a takeaway for you. So anyway, thank you very much.